Yeah, I'll react to that, sure. How have I not seen this? My hope is to watch enough uh, English history YouTube videos to the point where it just gets ingrained in my memory. To be honest, I think my knowledge of British history and my knowledge of American history are pretty on par at this point. It doesn't sound great to say that. Let's go. My name's Connor. Hello. I like to learn about things. Phones away. Toss it. Even if you're watching on a phone. Throw it away. Let's do it. Names are hard, especially when it comes to the British Isles. The island of Britain is home to England, Scotland, and Wales, while the that. island of Ireland is composed of the Republic of Ireland and the United Kingdom's Northern Ireland. This is not only a nightmare to keep track of, but as we've seen, this is all subject to change, probably a little sooner than we think. I say all this to clarify what we're actually going to be talking about in this video. England. Now, not only is England not Britain, but its history is plenty interesting all its own. So, to see how England grew from a simple Roman province to the master Go. of Britain and a major world power, let's do some history. Our earliest documentation for England comes with the arrival of Julius Cheekbone Caesar, who crossed over from Gaul in 55 BC. The native Celts were none too pleased with their new neighbors, so Rome kind of stalled for a century until Emperor Claudius established the province of Britannia. Roman influence on the island was rather slim outside of the main port cities. Since it was hard enough to schlep all those armies across the channel, they were happy to delegate certain responsibilities to the local kings. In 60 AD, one such client king bequeathed half of his lands to Rome, but when the empire glommed all of it, but anyway, the late king's wife Boudicca led a rebellion that burned through several eastern cities, including Londinium, before she was defeated in battle. Later, Romans expanded outwards to the edge of Caledonia before Hadrian said nope and built a wall across the island to stop any hotshot general from getting ideas. The benefit of Britannia's insulation a wall across the island to stop any hotshot general from getting ideas. The benefit of Britannia's insulation was that it didn't see much disruption from the carousel of imperial civil wars, but the downside was that Britannia was the first province to be cut loose when the barbarians barbarians started rolling up in the 400s. The next several centuries are marked by a constant shuffling between small romano britannia Map and progress. And a kingdoms and a tidal wave of northern European newcomers. The polite term for this is disorganized, and the accurate term for this is gross. The early medieval <laughs> period saw raids and migrations from Picts, Angles, Jutes, and Saxons. And while the map doesn't stop fidgeting with its borders anytime soon, the players get a little clearer by the late 600s. Here we can see seven major Anglisk and Saxon kingdoms of Northumbria, Kent, East Anglia, Mercia, Essex, Sussex, and Wessex. Those last three being East, South, and West Saxony, in case you were wondering why England sexed up so many of its place names. These kingdoms weren't entirely Britannic nor fully Germanic. Just like the Romans, it was a case of gradual integration between lots of small and unique groups of people. Sometimes friendly, eh, sometimes stabby. For a dash of literary Stabby. context, the legendary Arthur? character of King Arthur is set specifically against the backdrop of these Germanic migrations. Historically speaking, our record gets a little clearer in the Christian monasteries of Northumbria, where the scholar Bede wrote the ecclesiastical... A big thing is the... Um, the, the Pope's thing in Archbishop of Canterbury. That was always the thing that confused me, but it is pretty much right. A, a, a representation of the church in England, so they weren't exactly under the dominion of any English authority, right? history of England, our best source for this period. And monasteries all across Northumbria were becoming magnificent palaces. I'm so stupid, I'm wearing this backwards. This is of literature and art throughout the 6 and 700s. Northumbria can have a little bit of a golden age, as a treat. The good news is that this was really shiny, but the bad news is that maybe this was a little bit too shiny, as the glittering attracted our old pals the Vikings, who rolled up to the island monastery of Lindisfarne to save the priceless relics from the totally unrelated fires that started burning right as the Vikings arrived. Weird. From there, the Vikings kept on coming, raiding all up and down the coasts and even heading inland with the great heathen army. This was especially bad news for the King of Wessex, <laughs> who was partway through conquering Mercia when- I'm a child. 
and the Scandinavians glomped their way down the eastern coast. They didn't have the means or the interest to form a single unified state, but the bad news for the King of Wessex, who was partway through conquering Mercia when the Scandinavians glomped their way down the eastern coast. They didn't have the means or the interest to form a single unified state, but the laws of these incoming Danes held sway over a pretty beefy stretch of land. So we call this thingy the Dane Law, because when historians aren't creative, they're at least direct. While the Dane Law became a shiny mercantile midpoint between Ireland and Scandinavia, Navia, it was soon reverso glomped by the Kingdom of Wessex. By 927, King Ethelstan had conquered all the way to Northumbria and began to style himself as King of England. Wessex. Finally, we can add to Northumbria and begin to style himself as King of England. So now, finally, we can actually discuss England as a single state. In the century following, Northumbria played hopscotch between English and Viking rule, and some wacky royal gymnastics resulted in the Scandinavian Canute becoming King of England, Denmark, and Norway for two decades. But despite the near constant tire fire of Scandinavia, Alright, guys, Denmark, so that means there had to have been some conflicts going on between people over here while conflicts were going on from people over here going to over here correct that sounded confusing but so it's not like this was a, a conjoined empire the entire time that that conquered this area it was that there were a bunch of different people from this area conquering over here and eventually they conquered themselves right Norway for two decades. Something like that. But despite the near constant tire fire of Scandinavian invasions and an extremely squiggly royal lineage, England had become impressively well run for the time as the governing bureaucracy was organized and they knew how taxes worked. Not bad. But as will become a running theme in the next few centuries, to be continued in 1776. There's no getting overworked. Not bad for the time, as the governing bureaucracy was organized and they knew how taxes worked. Ah. Not bad. But, as will become a running theme in the next few centuries, there's no getting over that pesky question of royal succession. After the death of King Edward in 1066, the crown passed to Harold Godwinson. But two other parties- Finally, like this used to be so, it, it still is, and I need to conquer the Henry VIII time with all those damn Marys. Mary. Mary, Mary's Mary, Mary, Bloody Mary, Mary the First, Mary of something, Mary. I hate it. He's wanted that shiny headwear for themselves, namely King Harold Hardrada of Norway and Duke William of Normandy. Hardrada arrived to challenge Godwinson for the title of one true herald, but was beaten at the Battle of Stamford Bridge. However, Godwinson's luck ran out one month later when... And that's the Norman Conquest in a nutshell. In contrast to the other assorted cases of England being conquered, this one had lasting significance. Firstly, William was set on keeping his hot new kingdom, so he invented this little doohickey called a castle and built him all over England to protect his armies from the odd revolt. Meanwhile, he replaced the English aristocracy with freshly imported Norman barons. Now, the Normans, being from France, were French, so they spoke their native language instead of the local Old English. Over the centuries, these two languages swashed into each other to create what we recognize as English, our beautiful disaster of a language. The last significant consequence was that William was still Duke of Normandy, and his supervisor, the King of France, was a little miffed that he went and yoinked himself a kingdom. And this diplomatic hiccup would embroil England and France in a casual 600-year-long rivalry. Now, France this is entered. normally the point where English history slavishly trails along the royal family tree through all its twists and turns, but this video point where English history slay Mary. Mary the first? Where are the other Marys? Slavishly trails along the royal family tree. Mary. Mary Princess. Through all its twists and turns, but this video is a summary and I don't care about kings. Royal gymnastics are far too dull to be this needlessly confusing. I say this now so we can skip the faff later on. What matters to us here in the middle 1100s is that the royal family married across so we can skip the I faff read later that. on. What matters to England started using St. George's Cross in the 1190s, becoming the official, the official flag centuries later, but life is easier if we take consistent icon iconography where we can get it was here in the middle 1100s is that the royal family married across the channel so now the king of england aquitaine? became the duke of normandy the count of anjou and the duke of aquitaine england has never been taller this angevin period rewrites anglo-frankish relations to the tune of you got chocolate in my peanut butter anywho with this absurdly how did they keep uh Brittany? 
relatively large tax base and access to half a France load of natural resources up and down the Atlantic coast, the Angevin Empire was an economic powerhouse. Of course, money means rich people, Robin? and rich people means armed robbery, so this period is the main historical setting for the legends of Robin Hood, really? most closely associated with the reign of the crusading King Richard the Lionheart at the turn of the 13th century. When is Shakespeare a thing? When was Shakespeare, like, the 1500s? I feel like he was either the 1400s or the 1600s. Okay, late 1500s. He was married to Anne Hathaway? That doesn't make sense. Okay, all right. Ah, oh no. Century. Speaking of military stuff, England took this opportunity to hop westward and glomp onto the Dublin-y part of Ireland. They tried for more, but they didn't really get much else. Conquest is all well and good, but it's also expensive, and France was itching to get the rest of its France back, so the early 1200s saw Normandy, Anjou, and most of Aquitaine go poof. Meanwhile, the barons were fed up with the monarchy, that makes two of us, so they forced a few kings to sign a contract recognizing that teamwork makes the dream work. As in, the Magna Carta makes kings consult their barons, and this puts us on track to get Parliament a ways down the line. Elsewhere in Britain, King Edward Longshanks conquered the Kingdom of Wales and glomped onto Scotland for a hot second, but they broke free. The problem for England was William. that Scotland had allied with France, and by the mid third What news of the North? Uh, uh, shoot, I messed it up. Second, but they broke free. The problem for England was that Scotland had allied with France, and by the mid-1300s, France was in a century-long win streak. King Edward III was a big fan of the part where England owned half of France, so he went for broke and claimed a right to the French kingship to justify a continental invasion. A bold strategy. It won't work. But it took a century for that to become apparent. From 1337 to 1453, Joan? England and Joan France were locked in a hundred years war. Edward oversaw the first act, where the English poured across the channel and thrashed the French army at the Battle of Cressy. To explain why, we've got to dig into the real juicy stuff. Economics. <sighs> All right, look, I minored in econ. I have to at least pretend like this was worth something, okay? <laughs> it all comes down to how they collected taxes. England had the sophistication to tax money and put it towards a professional army, while France took payment in goods and conscription, so their army was bigger, sure, but far. England could raise significant revenues by taxing incoming merchant ships at port. Those revenues paid for Welsh longbowmen, and the rest is GG. France had a system called scuttage, which allowed a lord to call his subjects to arms for a period of 40 days. Weaker. England's advance would have pressed on were it not for the surprise guest appearance of Joan? plague. Oh. Soon after the fighting resumed, the new French king, Charles V, had a much better time than his predecessor and pushed the English out to the edges of Gascony and Calais. The third phase of the war is the spicy stuff that shows up in all those Shakespeare plays. We're talking Battle of Agincourt, Henry V, Hella Longbows, take that, Frenchies! <clears throat> After the loss, France fell into a civil war and almost collapsed until Joan Kickass de Arc arrived to absolutely steamroll the England. I heard one of our good friends or like close male subjects was like the first serial killer and like killed like 30 feet, 30 children or something like that. But that's beside that's a story for a different time. And almost collapsed until Joan Kickass right? de Arc arrived to absolutely steamroll the English. King Henry VI had exactly zero ways to handle this, so England got swept right on out of there. By 1453, all they had left was a tiny little sliver of Calais. Despite the war's overt goal of conquer France, it inadvertently cemented a distinct English identity through language, national heroes, and insular geography. The other major consequence was interesting. Nothing quite uh pulls a, a nation together like a big conflict that they can look back to in, in decades, centuries to come as a sort of stone to a Touch two was big shock, Matt. another succession crisis. I've covered the War of the Roses before, and I respect you too much to bore you with this. All that matters Thank is that you. a king died, and two families spent a century stabbing each other over who would get the crown. Plot twist, both of them. Big up families spent a century oh, yeah. stabbing <laughs> I forgot in the end they kind of each other over who would Unimpressed knight cares even less for your monarch. Get the crown. Monarchy. Plot twist, Mon both Meh. of them. Monarchy. Big ups to Henry VII for marrying the houses of York and Lancaster together to create the Tudor dynasty and resolve that mess for good. The Tudors managed to accomplish quite a bit in their century-long runtime. Don't say the marry order of business for time. King Henry VIII was to formalize the rules for royal succession, presumably because he had to read about the War of the Roses and decided never again. But he also had outside problems, as King Charles of Spain and the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V, coincidentally the same 
named Charlie, was getting a smidge overpowered since he put the Pope under house arrest. Further complicating matters was the little fact that Henry's first wife was also Charles's aunt, and she wasn't bearing any male heirs. Henry deftly solved the three problems of Charles, the Pope, and his wife in one move, by going diet Protestant and forming his own church. This new Church of England didn't really lean that hard into Protestant theology, but the real swerve was that the church answered only to the king. This quasi-reformist compromise wasn't exactly the easiest thing in the world to enforce, but the Tudor's king. This quasi-reform... Some thought you went too far, others thought you went too, uh, didn't go far enough. I mean, that just, that's the story of humans. Theology, ...but the real swerve was that the church answered that only to ah. the king. This quasi-reformist compromise wasn't exactly the easiest thing in the world to enforce, but the Tudors made it work. Meanwhile, back in geopolitics land, Henry made a new push into Ireland, and tried, and failed, to bully Scotland into uniting with England. In the second half of the century, Queen Elizabeth I held the fort against an increasingly aggressive Spain, way too hyped on conquistador cash... Isn't this the beginning of, like, like, the formal beginning of the British Navy as a dominant force? remember what hubris means. In 1588, Spain hucked an armada at England in the hopes of conquering it, but English Bail. cannons and English weather smashed the fleet to bits. When Elizabeth died without an heir, the crown passed to her like nearest the male relative, who happens to be King James VI of Scotland. I need to learn about this guy. So in 1603, James became King of Scotland and England. Everything after the Union of the Crowns is the Britain plotline, where they glomp all the isles, make an empire, all that rule Britannia jazz. So this is where we'll wrap our history of England. And I'll be fully honest, honest. Sagas like this give history a bad rap. At a glance, it's a 1600 year long nightmare that's stuffed with more monarchs than anybody should be forced to remember. And it's easy to get bogged down in any one episode. I'm gonna remember every single one of them just to I'm gonna do that after this. ...or to lose track entirely. But the good news is that just because English historians are sadistically meticulous and blindingly self-obsessed doesn't mean that we have to be. Because if we zoom out a little bit and focus on England as a unit rather than a backdrop for royal gymnastics, the important kings will make sense in context and we avoid getting bogged down in the details. So then we can clearly see the macro plot progression from Roman province through the Heptarchy into the conflicts with France and out towards the formation of Britain. So let English history show why the big picture is often the clearest, and also serve as an object lesson in the historiographic benefits of restraint. Thank you so much for watching. You can tell this is an OSP history video because I run away at the slightest hint of early modern Europe. <laughs> True. Uh, guys, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna get right into memorizing the kings right now, just to sit. Hope you're all doing well, or can teach me stuff, or learn something, or just chill. Love y'all. Hope you're doing well. If not, emotions are fickle. Chin up. You'll be good soon. Don't worry. See ya.